Hi, I'm Sebeni Yaakov. This presentation is entitled High Voltage Flyback Capacitor Charger. There are some relevant reference to this presentation. These are videos, YouTube videos, a flyback converter, flyback primary side control, and design of flyback magnetics. All these provide the details of the subject matter that I'm going to talk about in this presentation, and also to help in a design of an actual charger. So we are talking about a capacitor charger. Capacitor charger is a system in which you charge a capacitor. While charging, there is no load, okay? So you are just charging the capacitor, and I'm talking about high voltages, like kilovolts, and once the capacitor is reaching the target voltage, then the charger will stop. And then at a given point, the load will discharge the capacitor. Could be in different ways, okay? Now, there are many applications that, re that require capacitor chargers to high voltage. For example, flash lamps, uh, xenon lamps used for excitation of laser, igniters, x-ray machine, these usually use a higher voltage, and then defibrillators, detonators for bombs and some other ammunition. So there are a range of applications in which you have to charge a capacitor to a high voltage, and I'm concentrating on this application and talking about one particular way of doing it, and that is by flyback converter, which is very convenient, although there are some other ways for very high voltage you might wish to go to a resonant converter. I'm not discussing it here. Now, the flyback converter can operate in a number of ways, continuous current mode, discontinuous current mode, or borderline current mode. I'll talk about these later on. It is important to realize that this magnetic element is not a transformer, although it looks like a transformer. In fact, when drawing it or when you look at it, it looks like a transformer, but it's not a transformer. It's a coupled inductor. The difference being that in a transformer, there is a current coming in and the same time current coming out of the secondary. In a coupled inductor, you might have a situation in which current is coming into the unit, charging it with energy, and then this energy will come out at a later stage at the secondary without actually having a current at the primary. So there is a big difference. And in the design, you do have to have a air gap if it is a ferrite core. So it's a different magnetic element, a coupled inductor. Now, the inductor is connected in such a way that indeed when the voltage at the primary is positive, like in the dot, it's positive, and if the transistor is conducting, then it, this is ground. Then you have here positive and here negative, and therefore the diode will not conduct. So that it is built in such a way that indeed when the transistor is turned on, there is no current at the second. Now, there are a number of ways you can charge a capacitor. The simplest one from the conceptual point of view is a constant current. If you have a constant current feeding a capacitor, then the voltage will rise linearly. Okay, here it is. The VDT is linear with the current, and also the power will rise linearly. But this is a very poor way to charge a capacitor. The reason is that at the very beginning, you have very low power because if the current is constant and the voltage is very low, there is very little power coming into the capacitor, meaning there is very little power processed by the charger. And therefore, you are not actually utilizing it to, it to the extent that you can. You can actually use it to a higher level of power. So this is why a constant power is a better way to go. In this case, the input current, that if the average input current is constant, we have a, we assume, of course, a constant input voltage. So we have a constant current at the input. The power, therefore, is constant. And then we can show that the voltage does not rise linearly and 
rightly so, because at the beginning, the rate of rise could be much higher with the same power, but at a very high voltage, you cannot have a fast DVDT because you are limited by the power. Okay, so this is a better way to go. Now, as I have said, the operation of the flyback could be in a number of ways, and the simplest, the classical way is the continuous current mode. Well, continuous current mode in this case is really not the exact term because the current is not continuous. What is continuous is the energy in the magnetic element. And here I'm showing the basic operation of this uh, mode. We have the control signal, which is turning on and off the switches. When the control is high, the switch is on. Current is building up, but as you'll see, it doesn't start from zero. There is already energy in this magnetic element. And the energy is stored in the core, not in the wire, okay? And so there is a, some magnetic energy stored in the core. As you turn the switch on, you already have a current which represents this energy. And then because of the voltage imposed on the primary, the current starts to go up until you turn off the switch. When you turn off the switch, then the energy finds its way, you might say, to go through the dial this way. You see energy went into the dot. This is the magnetization of the core. And therefore, it will continue going into the core, same magnetization polarity, and therefore the current will go this way and then go out and charge the capacitor. Here I'm showing a load. It's taken from another presentation, but we are talking about just the capacitor, of course. And in this case, the transfer ratio between input and output is given by N. This is the number of turns. At the secondary, we have higher number of turns. We want to boost up the voltage, and then the ratio of D on to D off, which is the duty side. Now in the DCM, the situation is different. We start the cycle with zero energy in the core, so the current is rising from zero, getting to a certain level, and then we turn off the switch. Again, the current is coming out, and now we allow the current to go all the way to zero, and usually there is some dead time here. And then there is the new cycle coming up. And here is the dead time duration. Now the transfer ratio could be higher than this expression that we've seen in CCM. And this is an advantage, but as we'll see later on, the DCM has some shortcoming, so this is why it's not a preferred approach. The preferred approach is BCM, that's a boundary current mode, and in this case it's very similar to the DCM except that we don't have the dead time, okay? We allow the current of the secondary to go to zero, and then we start a new cycle. So we need for that a zero detection of the secondary current and start immediately the next cycle. So this is preferred. The transfer ratio is like in the CCM because the boundary is between CCM and DCM. So it's sort of uh, abide the transfer ratio for CCM and DCM. So this is the transfer ratio. And you can get, of course, a voltage that you need by adjusting both the duty cycle and the number of. In this case, of course, you don't have a dead time. During D on, you have a current at the primary, and during T off or D off, you have a current at the second. Now, one reason that we like the BCM, the boundary current mode, is that it has lower losses. Well, the reason is the following. In the case of the CCM, since there is already current as you start the cycle, then, and the voltage before you turn on the transistor is high, then you have quite a bit of an overlap between the current and the voltage. Now, in the case of the BCM, in fact, it is also in the DCM, you start with a zero current or lower current, and therefore, the overlap between current and voltage is minimal, and therefore, the losses are lower, 
so the efficiency of the system is much higher. In this case, we also have lower losses of the output capacitance because as it turns out, the voltage actually starts to drop by itself due to some parasitic effect. This would be like a reverse current of the diode and the secondary. So this approach, BCM, is really preferred certainly from the point of view of the loss. And here I'm showing a simulation of a case of a BCM. We see here the MOSFET current going up, starting from about zero. We see the voltage going down sort of by itself due, as I've said, the parasitic oscillation and injection of current. And then we have the current of the inductor going up. So certainly the overlap is minimal, although we have some losses due to the output capacitance here. Now the losses of DCM as far as this switching that I've just discussed are basically the same, but we are losing here conduction losses. And the reason is the following. For a given average current that you need for a given power, if you have this dead time, so you are obviously chopping the current more, and therefore the RMS of the current will be larger than in the case that you don't have any dead time in which the RMS will be lower because uh, you don't have time wasted, so to speak. So therefore the BCM has also an advantage in this respect too. Now there are a number of issues when it comes to a flyback as a capacitor charger. First of all, we have the classical problem of leakage between the primary and secondary. I'm not going to discuss it. It is covered in the video that I've referenced. Obviously, for high voltage, you have an issue of insulation. It has nothing to do with the flyback, but with the fact that you have wires, that, that there is a high voltage between them. So you have, uh, while winding the transformer, the magnetic element, then you have to worry about uh, sparks and then also there are some standard safety standards you have to uh, take care of. And then we have actually a design problem of breakdown of component. Now, having high voltage means that the transistor and diode will be exposed to a high voltage, high stresses. So you have to make sure that you don't expose these elements to too high of a voltage. It's as specified for them in the data sheet. So let's have a look at the voltage stresses. During the operation, we have a certain output voltage. Of course, when the capacitor is fully charged, this will be the highest voltage. Now, when the transistor is on, voltage here at the dot is positive, here is negative, here is positive, here is negative, so the diode does not conduct, but it is now exposed to the output voltage in the reverse direction, plus the voltage across this secondary in the reverse direction. And this voltage here is n times the input voltage, because this element works also as a transformer as far as the voltage ratio goes. So therefore, the total reverse voltage on the dial is V out plus n times V in, quite a bit. And then, when the transistor is off, we have a current through the secondary. So the secondary is clamped to the output. Plus is here. So here we have a positive voltage, which is added to this voltage. So the total voltage across the transistor will be V in plus V out, but now divided by N because this is one to N. But still, V out is a very large voltage, so the significant. Now, as it turns out, when N is large, you have a high voltage across the diode, here it is, while the voltage across the transistor is smaller. So one has to choose here the number of turns to be compatible with the transistor that he is choosing and the diode, or to choose the diode and the transistor according to the number of turns, whatever you look at it. But anyhow, there is here a degree of freedom that you have to take into account. Now, there are a number of ways to reduce the stresses, and I'm showing here, first of all, a doubler, a voltage doubler at the output. This is actually one stage. We can have a number of stages, of course, like Crawford ladder. 
but with many stages, the efficiency usually goes down. So let's concentrate on this uh, doubler. Now, the way it works is that this capacitor is charged to the secondary voltage. That is, when the transistor is on, we have here plus and here minus, because here is plus and here is minus. So this capacitor is charged to n times v in. So when the switch is off, we have the current going this direction, and we have an added voltage here, which is, of course, increasing the output voltage. Okay. Now, as far as the stresses go, when the transistor is on, the capacitor is charged so that the maximum reverse voltage on the diode here is only V out, the output voltage, because there is a short here, you might say low voltage across the conducting diode. And when the transistor is off, we see then the reflected voltage, which will be the total voltage here, shown here, plus the input voltage, and it turns out that it is V out over N. So we are gaining some stresses here because we have only V out over N. And on the other hand here, we have a lower voltage across the diode. But then, of course, you need another diode. We need a capacitor for a high voltage. So there is no free lunch here. But this is one way to go. Another way is to have split secondary, that is to have a number of sections. All the sections are the same. So the reflected voltage of the primary is like one section. Doesn't matter that you have a number of them in parallel. But at the output, they are connected in series. So by that you can get, if they are M section, M times the gain. So the reflection is a function of the number of turns, 1 over n, and then you get a higher gain. So therefore, the stresses of like one section, and then you have a number of sections, so you have a much higher output. And here is a controller by analog devices, LT3750. This is a capacitor charger, designed for a capacitor charger, based on a flyback. Here is the flyback. But it has some very interesting features to it. Number one is that you have here a measurement of the current of the actually primary while the transistor is on. And then there is a limiter to the current. So the current will go up to a given point and then it will stop. So it will limit the maximum current. And then it has a detection of the secondary current such that it works in BCM. Now this detection is done from the primary looking at the primary winding and at the same time also the control of the output is done from the primary side looking again at the primary voltage. Now this is also discussed in one of the videos that I have referenced. I highly recommend that you look at it if you are not familiar with the technology. So you can adjust the maximum capacitor voltage actually it's by these two resistors and by this resistor you can determine the peak current so here is how it works you see that the peak current is kept constant we see a charging sequence we see here the drain voltage which of course is going up because the output voltage is going up and the reflected voltage is going up. So we see the voltage is going up. And here we see the drain voltage. And then we see the primary current and the secondary current. You see that it's a BCM operation. There's no dead time here. And um, as soon as the secondary current goes to zero, then it starts a new cycle. Again, there is the need for a zero detection, zero current detection. And as you can see also, the current is limited to, in this case, about 
6 amp. Obviously, if you change the resistor here, you can go to a higher current, but then you have to make sure that the resistor will, of course, operate properly with the higher current. Now here we see the startup. We have a initial pulse, which causes some current at the secondary. Now the drop here is very slow because the output voltage is very low and the rate of change of the voltage, of course, <coughs> and the rate of change of the current is, of course, a function of the voltage. So because we have a low voltage at the secondary, then the rate of change of the current is low. As the voltage builds up, we see a faster and faster rate of change. And in this case, as we can understand, the frequency will be lower than when the output capacitor has a high voltage. Now, the reason is the following. This time, the on time is constant because the on time depends on the input voltage and the inductor and the limit of the current. So this time is constant, while this time is a function of the output voltage. So the higher the output voltage, the shorter will be this time. And in this case, at the beginning, I measured here, this uh, cycle here, it's 34 kilohertz. Now, when we go toward the end, you see that this is much shorter time because the voltage is high, so it drops very quickly. And then, the, in this case, the frequency is 90. So the BCM is not a constant frequency. It's a variable frequency starting with the lower frequency to a higher frequency. So let's see what are the considerations for designing uh, this uh, BCM flyback charger. Now here are the basic uh, parameters that are relevant to this issue. This is the, the on time. We have the peak value, which is held in this particular case constant. And then we have the off time, which is a function of the output voltage and also the number of turns we'll see. And so this is the crucial waveform for the design. So we start off with the on time. Now the state equation for the inductor is this equation here from which we find that the on time is the L times I peak over V in, okay? So this is the on time, and as I've said, since V in is constant, L is constant, and I peak is constant, the on time is, of course, constant. The off time can be calculated from the fact that the inductance at the secondary is N square L, and so this will be the off time. Of course, it will depend on the output voltage, not the input voltage. So this is the off time. And the total period on and off is this expression here. So when the output voltage is very, very high, then this uh, term drops off and we get that the maximum frequency is this value here. Okay, V in over L I P is the maximum frequency that you can get in this system. Now then we can calculate the input power. The input power is the average current times V in over 2 and then times the duty cycle, okay? Now again, when the duty cycle is very large at the end, this is like 1, but when the duty cycle is shorter, then of course the power is lower and we can see it here. This is the expression for the input, and I'm assuming it's the output. I'm neglecting here in this calculation the efficiency. You see that you have this term here, and so that when the output voltage is small, then this is large value and very little power is going in, but very quickly as V out is getting higher and higher, this term is becoming smaller and smaller. So the maximum power is again uh, this expression. So here is a sort of a suggestion for an approach for an approximate design of, of this of a system like that. I'm assuming that what is given is the input voltage, the maximum frequency you want, the amount of energy you have to store. Okay, this will determine the capacitance and the output voltage. You have to determine it. 
and then the time that you can allow for charging the capacitor, okay? So the average power that you need is the total energy divided by the total time. This is the average power that you need for charging the capacitor. Now, I'm assuming that the average power is the maximum power times 0.8. This is from looking at the charging curve, and you can do it yourself for your particular case, although it can be calculated, but it's going to be a bit messy, so I highly recommend to do simulation. Now, from this, you can find what is the IPIC that is required, okay? And then, if you know IPIC, you know VIN, you know F maximum that assumed, then you can calculate the inductance. Notice that the higher the frequency, the lower the inductance that you need, because the rate of rise of the current is faster, so you need shorter time, and meaning that you can run it at a higher frequency. And here is an expression for AP, which is the product, the area product of the cross-section area of the core times the window uh, winding area, okay? And this is a tool for designing the magnetic element. Again, you can find the details in the video that I have referenced. And this parameter is equal to the inductance, the peak current, the RMS current of primary and secondary, and here we have the number of turns, the B max that you allow for the core, and when the frequency is high, this will be determined by the losses rather than saturation, because at high frequency, the limiting factor is, is the losses for the magnetic flux density. J is the current density in the wire, and K is the filling factor. Again, all this is given in the video that I have referenced. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it of interest, and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.